Take it away, Nancy. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. We were kind of worried about an hour ago when it was pouring down rain and uh, and, the, and the temperature dropped. So I really appreciate it. Uh, today we're gonna I'm gonna talk about some tips about in the garden, and I think we can use all the tips we could get. Uh, but at the top, first we'll do a little bit of, of housekeeping here. At the top, you have Yardner.com. That's my late partner, Jeff Ball's website. And that's a problem-solving website. So if you have a problem with something, if you go to Yardner.com and put in, say, a problem with what a hydrangea or whatever, chances are you're going to, if whatever comes up and you click on it, you're going to find out what your problem is and a solution to it. But if you don't, or you have a question, or you're just impatient, you can email me because right on the on the web page, the front page, it says Ask Nancy. Uh, that would be me. And so if you click on it, uh, you will have a form that comes up, and you can put your question in there. And as one, who is the lady that said I am? Okay. This young, this young lady here has, uh, is a regular customer of mine, I guess. And so I try to get back usually within a few days. There may be an instance when maybe I, you won't hear from me, say, for a week or, or 10 days. In that case, sometimes things fall into the draft. You know, they go into the ether. I don't know what happens to them. I'm, I'm kind of flying fingers. So. so just send it again. That's called pinging. And, and be sweet and say, uh, gee, or you don't have to say anything, you just resend it. And chances are I will get back to you. So, so do let me know. Um, don't be sassy because <coughs> I have a delete button. And I don't use it. Uh, I, don't, I, I have two big brothers and I don't need anybody to pick on me. They do a good job. So, so I do the best I can. So, but I'll be happy to work with you. And if I don't know the answer, I have lots of folks that I know all over the country. And so I have people who I can ask. And I get questions. I've had questions from Australia. I had one from <coughs> Dubai. What the hell goes on in Dubai that I, I don't know. They ski in the middle of the desert, for God's sake. Yeah. So, so uh, but anyway, I will do my best to answer those. If you have any questions while I'm talking about what I'm talking about, uh, please raise your hand and I'll be glad to, to um, take your questions then. And then at the end, we'll do a Q&A. I don't have to run home and because I don't have to cook today. <laughs> because I already had my hot dog and I might have another one and that would be dinner and then I'm done. So uh, so I'll be glad to, to hang around if there are things you want to you know, talk about. Um, I'm going to talk first about, I'm sure most of you have, if you have a garden outside or a landscape, you've had shrub damage. Anybody have shrub damage? Yeah, yeah it's like, oh my God. It's, we waited so long for that, that ice to get and snow to go away. And then people's, especially boxwoods, boxwoods and um, hollies have been particularly damaged this year. And there are a couple things you can do. I'm telling people to please be patient. Uh, with some shrubs, what happens is there are latent buds under the stems or under the branches. And so what happens is if those uh, especially with evergreen, sometimes the needles will fall and new needles will come out. And that's what happens like with pine trees. They lose a lot of their needles on the inside every winter and then they form new ones. So that may happen, but that may not happen. And then in that case, you're going to have to make a decision. Do you just cut back or do you go for new? And in some cases, uh, a slight trimming will actually take care of it or shearing. And then and pretty soon the, the uh, new stuff is going to start coming out. So that will take care of it. But if not, if you're going to cut it back really hard, in a lot of cases, the tree, the, sh the shape of the tree or the shrub is going to be damaged. And it won't come back. I mean, in, in your lifetime, maybe. <laughs> it depends on how much patience you have. I figure I don't have a lot of time left, so I don't have a lot of patience. So, so I would consider at that point that you replace it, and I know that there's tons of stuff here that are some really, really beautiful specimen trees also that would look wonderful in your housing. And is that $64? 60, how much is that? That's $64.99. Wow, that's a beauty. So there are a lot of really good things, and there's a, a lot of new stuff on the market. So 
I would not hesitate to just kiss it goodbye, put it in the compost pile, and then go out and get a new one. And that's probably your best bet. If you have shrubs that, um, that have a little bit of damage, one of the things you could do and one of the things that I do is to give it a little bit of a feed. I start off with, this is Organimax. This is a compost that has humic acid in it. It's got a lot of different beneficial organisms in it. It's got micro, four different kinds of mycorrhiza in it. And I start off with a about just a quarter of an inch just about a layer that much on the surface of the soil. And then on top of that, I would usually put, I, I have saved all of my leaves. And what I did is I vacuumed them up and the shredded ones, I either put them on the garden, but I also have bags full of them. So I'll put about an inch of those shredded leaves on. And then I will put, scatter some of, this is holly toad. This is pretty much good for almost all trees and shrubs and especially for holly, ding ding, and of course rhododendrons, and these are acid-loving plants. A lot of people say when they have problems with their acid-loving plants, they write to me and they say, well, I put mirror acid on it. That's a waste of time. Number one, mirror acid is a chemical and it's a fast-release fertilizer. And one good rain and it's gone down beyond the root system. Most of your roots are in the top eight inches and it's, it's become soluble and it's washed away and it's gone. So it's not really going to help. This is, this is an organic and it's gonna take a little time to break down, but it will, feed the, it will feed your plants slowly and the way they should be fed, the way Mother Nature does it. Yes. Well, I work on yews. I have yes. a tight part next to the hedge of yews yeah. and they turn yellow from the higher heads. Oh, yes. so. Well, one of the things you might you might try her her use because she parks tire heat. How do you try the tires? tires? Yeah, they give off heat. I didn't know. Did you know that? <laughs> do you have trouble with tire heat? <laughs> no. <laughs> it takes the finish off your bent branch floor if you wow. Don't put the right stuff. In. Yes, um, actually, this would be good. And, and you certainly don't want to put anything like a mirror acid or spray anything, because that's a salt. Basically, um, those chemicals that you spray, um, like mirror acid or, or miracle Grow, those are salts. So they will only make it worse, and they can actually burn your plants. So it's best to use this. And use it according to the package directions. And then when you're done with that, you want to put organic, uh, uh, organic mulch three inches on top of it. And that's going to hold the moisture in because we're going to have to take very good care of these trees and shrubs because they're in stress right now. So we want to make sure, and water is key. Water is key. And most people <laughs> don't really do a proper job of watering. Uh, does anybody have any questions about any of that? Okay, you could say, um, how far can you tell that you need to go? Well, you cut back until it's green. Until you <laughs> yeah, green. until it's green. But don't. Cut, but when you're doing when you're doing hollies or anything like that, if you cut back and there and you and there's no green left, it's not going to regenerate. So, but hollies are difficult because how much do you figure you could cut back a holly? Not a lot. No, I and even like a lot of like yews and all that. We're not even cutting back right now because it's. It's too soon. Nobody really understands what's going to happen. I'm, we're talking to the growers and they're saying, well, I don't know, we've never seen this. It, it might go backwards, it might go forward. But even on the ewes, if you look at the stalks, there's sometimes there's buds on yeah, dead stalks. Exactly. Which is, so you want to be careful cutting back at all. Really, yeah, right now. I would wait until you start to have, because they're not budding out yet, because it's still cold. <laughs> really? <laughs> so. Yeah, I don't doubt that. It's, it was it was a brutal winter for them, very brutal. So deer ate mark. Well, that's true too. Okay, so basically, um, you know, just kind of keep them watered, mulch them, and a little bit of or of the uh, espoma. The reason that we put the Organimax down is is because what that's going to do is stimulate the beneficial organisms in the soil, and also it, because it has beneficial organisms, it's going to help break this down and get to the plant in a form that the plant can actually take it up. But we don't want to douse it with fertilizer because that's not going to help it. Okay? 
Um, again, as I said, keep your plants well watered. One of the things that people have a problem with, and they, they say to me, well, I have an in-ground um, irrigation system. If you have an in-ground irrigation system and you've had it for a couple years, you have no idea how well it's working. So what you need to do is test it. How do you test it? This is pretty low tech. It's called tuna fish cans, or these are actually cat food cans. And what, I, what we do is around each emitter, you take three or four of these and put it right around the emitter, and you run your water for 20 minutes, and then you measure how much is in the tuna fish cans and do the math. We want to put at least an inch of water on those shrubs a week if Mother Nature doesn't do it. And how do we know if Mother Nature did it? This is called a rain gauge. It works because when it rains, it goes in, okay? So, and the reason that you want to do this is because if you have an irrigation system and you've had it for a period of time, in some situations, if you're on a well like I am, the minerals can block up the emitters and so they need to be serviced. Sometimes maybe your lawn guy hits it with the lawnmower and that could be any of, could be any lawn guy, like maybe that lawn guy. <laughs> <laughs> so what you want to do is make sure how much it's coming out and if it's just dribbling out then you don't know. And as I said, this fellow said to me, well my plants they should be okay be, with, for water because I water every day. But what he's watering is his lawn. He's not watering his shrubs. And shrubs need more water than a lawn does. Am I not right? Shrubs need more well, pets. Okay. Well, go not ahead. Not evergreens. Not evergreens? Not evergreens. Well, Out the gate, they will. They, but after, after, after once evergreen, they're established? Yeah, once they're established, you, we, we caught a bag. We, do, we actually do a test. We'll take our evergreens and we'll put them on the asphalt parking lot in the heat of summer, because they'll actually do better. They'll, they die a lot of times from overwatering after they're established. Well, that's true, that's true. So, But you still have to know how much, if you are if you have an emitter that's just dribbling water out, then, you know, that's not gonna work. Right, right. That's not gonna work at all, right. so. What I usually do is I use a, uh, I use a moisture meter. Do you, do you have moisture meters here? No, ma'am. Um, Luster Leaf makes one and you can get them at usually where you buy uh, house plants. And it's a thing that you stick in the ground and it registers moist, medium, and dry. And most plants do best if the water, if their soil stays moist. So you don't want to have it soaking wet. And you don't want to have it dry, you want it moist. So it should be moist because that's the only way that a plant can actually get pick up nutrients is if, the, if, if there's moisture in the soil. So it's gotta have moisture in the soil. It's like a lot of people say the old rosemary's, you know, and you'll say, if you have a rosemary, that you should let the soil dry out before you water it. Guess what? Dry rosemary is a dead rosemary. <laughs> because in the wintertime, these are Mediterranean plants, and in the wintertime, it's cold and it's damp where they live. Taking them into a house where it's like a desert, and then we're letting them dry out, and that's why they die. So it's, they need to be kept moderately moist. I have a ro I had a rosemary that I had that was this tall. I had it for four years, and and it and it was fine until we lost power last this last winter. That's the end of that story. So so I do have some I have some history with that one. Unless you have a low area, that is not going to keep it sopping wet, trust me. Um, the other thing you want to do is, if you already have, I mean, how many already have uh, mulch on their on their evergreens and so forth? Does everybody mulch? Okay, what you want to do in the springtime is you want to fluff your stuff. And so what we want to do is go out and you can use either a garden fork uh, or something like this and actually loosen up that mulch and fluff it up. And the reason is, is because even when you use wood chips, over a period of time, they will pack down. And you can make, uh, and they can be actually impervious to water, and water will run off. So what you want to do is go up and fluff them up. And the other thing that happens is, is that when you do that, it also, um, 
makes it so that you get air in there, so you're not as likely to get um, kind of things growing in there like mushrooms or worse yet would be slime mold, if anybody's ever had slime mold. If, don't ask. If you haven't had it, don't ask. Just fluff your stuff and trust me. So, and then what you do is top it off. A lot of people will put mulch on and they'll wait for three years and then the mulch is gone. And it didn't disappear. What happened is it, it broke down and it's actually turned into compost. That's the way Mother Nature feeds her trees. You know, um, out in California, there is uh, a situation where they grew all these wonderful, um, what do they call it? the tall ones, redwoods, I'm sorry, uh, redwood trees, and they're, they're huge. I mean, you know, you can, you, they were able to actually draw and put a hole in one and draw it through it. And Mother Nature grew those without any fertilizer. Do you realize that? And simply she did it because what happened was is that as the trees in the wintertime, they drop their needles and they drop their leaves, and they feed, that's how they feed the soil. So it, it worked for her and it can work for us too. So simply what you want to do is don't wait three years because then you're going to have to go and start all over again. If you just top it off, say, an inch or a half an inch or whatever it needs so that it comes up to three inches, it's an easy way to do it. And it, you won't have a lot of work to do. And let's face it, the less amount we have to do, the more time we have to play. So, and I like to play. Any questions about that? What if you use rocks for mulch? If you use what? Well, that's a that's a problem when you use rocks for mulch because then if you want to add anything to it, you're going to have to scrape them off and so forth. You can use rocks. Um, I don't recommend it because I want to get some organic matter in there. So then you'd have to pull them off and then and then bring them back. But. You know, that's, but some people like to use rocks. They find that. We used them last year, so they're there this year, it's the first time. Yeah. So I, I wasn't sure. Yeah. If it's going to dry it out. If it's going to dry, dry it out? Dry out the plants. You have to make sure they're watered more. Well, actually, um, actually rocks are a form of mulch also, because they're going to hold the moisture in. They will do that. They will do that. But if you can get maybe some of this compost and get it in between the rocks and so forth, it's, you know, each, each situation is, is a little bit different. Our planting time is important. And one of the things a lot of people say is, when can I plant? Well, you can plant shrubs now. Anytime you can work, uh, it, that is the evergreens and so forth. Trees that are leafed out should not be planted until it's frost free. So kind of gear, like flowers, these perennials are gorgeous over here, but they're all leafed out. Now in my garden, the perennials are only this high. So I would not put those out because if we have a hard frost, and we've had, I had, we had two or three of them last week. So you want to wait for that unless you can cover them up. Um, and there's a product that I have here. Anybody ever use this? This is really good stuff. This is called Harvestgar. And uh, it's very thin material, and air goes through it, and light goes through it, and um, the sun goes through it, oxygen and so forth, moisture. But what it does is it will hold in the cold to about six degrees. So that means if at 32 is freezing, you can go down about six degrees, and so in the high 20s. If it gets below that, uh, then it, nothing is going to protect it. It's going to freeze. So, but if you if you are, we're in a situation where, especially you've already planted, and you think there's going to be a light frost, then this this would be a good thing to protect it. What's nice about it is if you're going away on the weekends, you can put it down. You can put rocks around it to hold it down. And you can just leave it in place. You don't have to pick it up because it's, again, I said. The sun goes through it, and the light goes through it, and moisture goes through it. So sometimes, in fact, when I want to do grass seed, this is what I use for my grass seed. I'll put my grass seed in, and then I'll put this over top of it. I water it, I get it, do everything I need to do. When I do grass seed, I put about a quarter of an inch of this stuff. I put my grass seed down, and then I put this on top of it, and then I, I use um, 
I use guard um, guard picks to put it to put it in, and I make them by using um, hangers. I cut the shoulders off of inexpensive, the, the ones you get from the, uh, the cleaners, and then you cut those off, and then you can use those to spike this down. And last fall, I I planted my grass on the 10th of October, and in 10 days I had a stand of grass up this high. So I watered it, and I made sure that I kept it watered. That's the one thing people make a huge mistake when they do grass, is they don't keep it watered, and you need to water it at least every day or possibly every other day, depending on the weather. But you have to keep it watered. How big is one of those sheets? Oh, this is pretty big, and they have even larger, they have in rolls there. This one is, uh, 10 by 15 feet, and it's uh, $14. And this lasts for a long time. You take care of it. It doesn't make any difference if it gets dirty. Don't try and wash it. Get a life, don't wash it. It's okay. It doesn't make any difference if it's a little on the gray side. It still works just as well. But if you put it in your washing machine, you, it'll just shred and you'll make a mess. So. Yeah, yeah, it's not worth it <laughs> to save for 14 bucks. So, don't worry about it. So roll it up, put it away for the winter, and then bring it back out again so that you have it in case of an emergency. Planting time is important. So when do you plant? And everybody, that's what everybody wants to know today, is when to plant. And temperature is key. Yes. Can you plant grass No, you can plant grass seed now. You know, I'll tell you. See this? Everybody needs one of these. This is a forsythia. And the great thing about this one, this one is, let's see the name of this one is, this is uh, Show Off. And they even have one that, I think this one, I'm not sure how tall this one gets. I think it's around four to five feet, isn't it? The Show Off. And then there's also another one that's even shorter. But the reason you, that you want this, what's beautiful about it is you can see the old fashioned forsythia would just have blooms up here. This one will continually bloom all the way up and down the stalk. So it's really a pretty plant and it's very easy to keep it at this height if that's what you want. The plant is supposed to be spring this year. It's lying this year. Oh no, my tulips are up. Yeah. It's not lying because oh, it's not lying because it does, it, it's reading the weather below ground, not above ground. Oh. <laughs> okay, that's what happens. Is we don't care what the ambient well, we do care what the ambient weather is, but it's the weather in the soil that makes a difference as to when you plant and even grass seed. And I can tell right now in my garden in my area that little little stuff is starting to the seeds are starting to uh, sprout. So it's, it's okay to put your grass seed in now. When this blossoms like this, it's time to cut back your roses and feed your roses. And I use rose tone for my roses. So, and then this also will tell you that it's time to put your um, pre-emergent down, which that's for crabgrass, if you had crabgrass last year. If you, didn't have, if you don't have any crabgrass, don't waste your money. You got better ways to spend your money. And so, uh, but that's why you need one of these. Not only are they pretty, but it also will tell you what's going on in your garden. And sometimes what happens is, is that maybe, maybe your neighbor down the street has one and his is blooming, but your situation is different. Everybody's garden is different. So we want to know what's happening in your garden. But the other way to know is most of our, our uh, cold weather plants can be planted when the temperature in the ground is 50 degrees. That's the soil. So how do you know? And we're talking about, we want to know what it is down about yay far. Well, I've had several soil thermometers and unfortunately I lose them. So they're still in the soil someplace. So a couple years ago, I had remembered that my partner, who was the cook, uh, had just bought a new hamburger thermometer. And this one, and it says zero to 220 degrees. And the thermometer is a thermometer. It doesn't know that it's supposed to be a hamburger thermometer. It just knows it's a thermometer. And so that's how it works. And don't buy one that says rare, medium, and well done, because that's not, that's not gonna work for you. But this one will work for you. And so you just stick it in the soil, and then you wait. And it says this one, it says the soil in here is about 60 degrees. 
So you wouldn't believe that, would you? But it is. So and it's not that cold. Now, the reason I have this on here, and this is simply a piece of ripstop nylon, but you can use ribbons or anything. And I put a hole in it, and then I just stuck this on here. Because that way, when I put it in the ground, if, if something happens, if I have to go to the ladies' room or the phone rings or whatever, and I run off, or I'm distracted, which I am often distracted, when I come back, I'll know exactly where it is. So this one I've been using for two years. And it works. So, pardon me. That's right. They're gone. I have three of them that are in my garden right now. So, and I put that on all kinds. Of, I mean, I put that on all my tools. Uh, this one, this one I didn't have it on. I brought it because I cleaned it up. I wanted to show you that I resurrected this one. It was so rusty. The rust was actually bubbling. here. So I put I put it on everything I can. I put ribbons on everything. Because I do I lose a lot. So two questions. Yes. For the um, heat and the soil and it has to be fifty degrees in That's oven. for cold weather stuff. That would oh. be for your cold that would be lettuce. I've already planted lettuce and I planted chard and I planted kale and pansies and things that, that can stand some cold weather. So those are okay. Now we're gonna get into the to the tender babies. The tender babies would be your begonias and uh, your uh, New Guinea impatience and things of that nature. We want the temperature to be 60 degrees. And it should be on your list. It's on your list. So I put that on there just for you. And then peppers are a, are a hot weather plant. And don't put your tomatoes in until it's 60 degrees. And they might even be happier if you wait until 72, the way things are going. Yes. Does it matter how low the temperature goes at night? Sure. If, if it's freezing, it's going to, we don't want it to get really cold. I mean, sometimes you can't help it, though. In other words, so her question was, does it matter how low it gets at night? Um, Generally speaking, warm weather, we don't plant, I don't plant where I am until um, probably the last week in May or the first week in June. Um, and that's, and I'm in Attica. And in the city, you may be 10 degrees warmer than I am. So you watch the ambient air too. You don't want it to get, you don't want to get down into the 40s every night. If it's still rolling down into the 40s, even if it's 70 during the day, that's pretty cold. No pepper will ever be happy if it turns to 40 degrees. A lot of people have trouble with peppers. They say they don't do well for them. And one of the problems is I've been told by pepper enthusiasts, I am not one of those. Um, I don't like hot peppers, so I don't grow them, and I don't know a lot about them. But I've talked to a lot of people who do, and they say you're better off waiting until it gets warm so that the, the uh, the temperature is 70 degrees, and it's probably about, I would say, no colder than 50 at night. And that's the time to plant your peppers. Because once they get in that ground and it gets cold, and they get cold, um, oftentimes they will stunt, or even if they make peppers, they're not as hot as they, they could be if you waited. So so that's, that's the secret to growing peppers. Um, so... That's when, you know, that's the important thing is, again, it's the temperature of the soil that we're looking at. So I know every time it gets warm, it's 70 degrees out, and you're thinking, oh my God, I'm going to just get out there and plant my little brain off. But what happens is, is you're, I, I don't even bother. Uh, and I do have some tomatoes that are waiting. I have a greenhouse, so I can keep the sun, and I don't have to worry about that. But um, I, don't, I don't plant them until it really warms up. Any other questions about that? About the timing? Okay. One of the thing, problems that a lot of people have is slugs. Slugs are a real pain, and that's when you, you have hostas and you have holes in your hostas. 
or they, they'll eat your marigolds. The leaves are gone on your marigolds. They love petunias. They thrive on petunias. And what do you do about them? Well, if you had slugs last year, I guarantee you, you're going to have slugs again this year. There's a product out, and it's got iron phosphate in it. And I didn't see, I didn't see it on the shelves, but I know, I know that um, that they have it here, one with iron phosphate. And that particular product is environmentally friendly, so that's a good thing. But it's also got wax in it, so that they're little granules. And basically, what you do is just sprinkle them. directions. Don't use too much of it because you're just wasting your money. When it's gone, usually in about 10 days to two weeks, if you have slugs, they'll come up and eat it. And then you put it on again. One of the big mistakes a lot of people uh, make, do you have, do you have a um, iron phosphate uh, sluggo or? I do. Yeah. Okay. Can you bring that out so we can I just show them what it looks like? Yes. Another helpful It's something in the seashells. You'll oh. never get rid of the smell of seashells, so never put them in your house unless you bleach them. Oh. But the seashells keep the slugs away. Jerry Baker had that in his book about 30 years Have ago. Have you done it? I've done it every year, and I leave my seashells out there. And I have never had okay. a slug. Okay, I've not no. heard that, but um, but it's worth trying. I use eggshells. Well, you can use eggshells, but you got to use a lot of eggshells. Yes. Um, and I just, so just a bowl. Yeah. I don't dry them in the oven. I just, all winter long, I take my seashells and I throw them in a plastic, or my eggshells, and I throw them in a plastic uh, bucket. And then I have a Vitamix, and I have one that has a blade in it. Uh, or you can also use uh, a coffee grinder if you have an old coffee grinder. And I, pow I grind mine up to the point where they're almost powder. And I use that not I use that in my tomatoes also. I put it on the surface of the soil around my tomatoes, and that will work also. But if you don't want to go through that, this stuff works also. So, and her comment was on on seashells that she collects seashells. Everybody seems to go to the show. What do you do? Well, right. And so what she does is she puts them in a flat pan. I have a. Decorative bowl. Um, she has a decorative bowl, and she says that they don't come around her seashells. Yep. So it's worth trying. And try it. If it works, email me and let me know. Well, the eggshells are going to wide an area where that protect. Well, it's about a six by six area, and, and it just sits there, and, and it'll protect. Them. Yeah, and it was a Jerry Baker's book. They use it in the south a lot of the houses. Okay. Well, I'd hey. No. What else do you do with seashells that somebody put your kids to life? I give them to my grand I give them to my grandson and then my daughter has to deal with them. I don't worry about it. That's what I do. Okay. So the soil and the turf, the soil if we're for turf care we're gonna we're going to uh, uh, do our seed when the soil is fifty degrees and if you have a space in your grass that's four by four. Look how red my hands are. Ooh, they're not happy. Uh, that's about, so this is about four, four inches for me. Four by four. That's not going to fill in. Mother Nature is, there's not enough time for that to fill in with grass. So that you're going to have to reseed. And a lot of people may have spots like that for a couple reasons. And also if you've had a lot of bowl damage. And bowl damage looks like, like little, like tunnels. that also because that's all bare that's all bare soil. The bare soil if left bare for too long you're gonna have that's where you get weeds in it. So I would reseed that also. And we talked about that. Is everybody clear on how to reseed? So uh, but I it, it's worth it to put a little bit of the compost down, put that seed down and probably the way the weather's been now you wouldn't even have to cover it because it's damp enough, trust me. So you don't have to worry about it. 
But the other thing is, when you put it down, it's a good idea to somehow, uh, whatever tool you use, I have a, I have a thing that my partner made that is a piece of wood on a pole, and then you tamp it. And the, the reason you tamp it is you want that seed to make contact with the soil so that it doesn't, it doesn't germinate and the root is exposed. So it needs to have contact with the soil. It's best you can do that. Um, sharpen the blades of your pruners and your loppers. All your tools that you're going to be cutting, you're going to be cutting a lot. And so what we want to do is to make sure that our tools are sharp. There are a lot of ways you can do that. How many people have this, by the way, is, uh, this is what I use for my herbs. Um, and as I said, I left it out and it was in pretty bad shape, but I cleaned it up. And I'm here to tell you, this puppy is pretty sharp. Now, how did I do that? Because I could never find my sharpener either. But I found out that this is excellent. And this is called a nail file by any other one is. And all you have to do is take your nail file and then just give it four or five of these every time you use it. And I'm here to tell you, it works like a charm. Now, guys don't like this color, so for you, I have this color. <laughs> these are available, gentlemen, at the grocery store. You can go down into the aisle that has nail polish and you will find them. This one is a medium gray. And I've used it on loppers, and I've used it on pruners, and I've used it on everything. Now, a lot of people will tell you, oh, well, you have to use just the right stone, and you have to use it at 25 degrees. I've got news for you. Um, I think I'm pretty good on that. I have on other loppers that have a, a really big be uh, bevel on it, I've taken a uh, black magic marker and I ran it down the bevel and then I see what angle it takes to take it off and I've gotten pretty good at it so this is just about right but you're welcome to come up, come up and try cutting with these because these are really you can take the tip of your finger off with them so I recommend you do that and the reason is is because when you're pruning when you're pruning it's important to have a sharp uh, sharp blades because otherwise what you're going to do is you're going to crush the stem and especially now because our plants are stressed anyway but when those stems are crushed they don't heal like they should and so it leaves it open for disease and it also leaves it open for insects so you're not doing your, your plants any favor when you're pruning if you're using dull blades. How many people be honest have, have, don't sharpen their blades, their pruners? I did after last week. See, I told you. Is that an every board you're using? Yeah. Yeah. It's an every board. Well, a nail file every board. Yeah. Yes. You can come up and look at them. Um, this one is this one is about a me. It's me. It's fine on one side and medium on the other. These black ones they usually use for plastic nails, which these are. But I like my nails, so. So I wear gloves. I am a dirt gardener. I'm a big time dirt gardener and I dig in the dirt a lot. Uh, this is a product that I believe in a lot if you are doing trees. If you're going to be transplanting trees or you're going to be planting new trees, this can mean the difference between life and death for your trees. Because what happens is, especially if it's a, uh, if it's a bald and burlap tree, it loses, they tell us, as much as 75 to 80 percent of their root structure it happens. So it really it has much fewer roots than it should have and so this is called a tree gator and you stick it on, zip it on the bottom and then you fill it up with water and it slowly waters the tree. And they, a lot of commercial plantings they use these. They use these in Chicago all up and down the Dan Ryan uh, Expressway on the sides where they have uh, where they have grass when they planted their new trees and it made a huge difference in the amount of trees that lived between those that died so so this is a tree gator and it's uh, it's very well made you can use it you know more than once it's not a one-shot deal so it's it's worth the investment how much is that uh, uh, this one is 28.99 but if you've ever had to dig a hole for a tree you don't want to do it twice as I told somebody 
my neighbor next door had bought a, I don't know, she bought a tree. She got it from Home Depot. And I said, you know, she said, but I got such a good deal out of it. I said, but it's dead. <laughs> a dead tree is not a good deal by any name. And I said, you know, if you would have, and, and she was, I said, she said, well, I got a guarantee. And I said, whoopee. You gotta dig that puppy up, you gotta take it back, you gotta bring another one back and put it in the ground and hope for the best. And I said, that is no bargain. So, and the other thing is, is when I put a tree in, I want it to live. I don't want to have to go through it again. So, so I recommend these. That's what they use commercially. I'm sorry, where do you put that alligator? You put it right at the base of the tree, right? You can see the picture on it. Okay, I'd like to see it. Those were developed, by the way, by professionals for profession for use in professional planting. So it's um, it's not just a gimmick. As far as watering is concerned, this is my tool of choice when I'm watering anything. If I if I don't want, especially if I don't want to uh, to get water on the you know on the top of it, I can get close to these. If you're using hanging baskets or anything, and even your seedlings or your new seed that you put down, because this is a beaker in here that put, that does a very fine spray. And so it's it's really perfect, it's easy to use, it's a lot of fun. And the new ones, which this is, has an adjustable, so you don't even have to hold it closed, you don't have to put any pressure on your hands at all, you can turn it on and off just with your thumb. So this one is made by Dram. They're the best quality. That's, this is the one I always buy. I have had cheaper ones. And what happens is they always spring a hole. They get loose right here. And unless your teenage son runs over this, it's guaranteed for life, by the way. So if you have a problem with it, uh, you know, let Dram know. Take a picture, email it to him, and tell him I said that it's guaranteed for life. I want a new one. They'll do it. I'm sorry, please answer one more question. How does the water get from this bay? It leaks out the bottom. Are there holes? Yes, there are holes. Okay. Weeding. Weeding is important. And um, I have folks. Oh, these are my two weeders of choice. These are both made by the same company. This is the Radius Garden Tool People. And these are also guaranteed for life. And all you have to do is take a picture of it and email it to the uh, to their website, and uh, and they they will uh, make arrangements for you to get a new one. So if anything happens to them, uh, actually the company is out of Ann Arbor. So how does it work? It, how does it work? Well, there's a machine. <laughs> <laughs> you hire someone. Right? <laughs> simply take it like this. And this is also ergonomically designed so that you don't have to do a lot of extra work as far as your wrist is concerned. And you simply put it in and pop it out. And this is sharp, so don't run your hand along this, you know, because you'll chew it up. And this is also sharp. This is really great for cutting your um, slugs in half or anything like that. So I use it. I also use this for planting. Um, I do have a problem with um, carpal tunnel and tendonitis in my wrist, so I have to be very careful. So what I try to do is I use um, I use trowels or weeders that have a very narrow handle because then I'm not pushing so much soil. And the way I use this is I put it in like this and I pop it backwards and pop stuff out. This is really really works. I even use this. Um, I have a, a walkway that's. Um, slate and I plant between the slate and then I have uh, pea gravel you know that on top of it so this works I can get I could get into past the pea gravel and get weeds that uh, in those areas that normally would be very difficult to get out so it works like a charm. Those, those are my two very best selling tools that I saw at the whole store those work really well and it's a local company too yeah. And on top of that, if you've never picked up one of those tools, it is substantial. I mean, it is oh. guaranteed to last your life. That, that is a nice, heavy tool. Yeah, and this is this is the long-handled one, and um, and it r basically works the same way. But if you're running around, I, I do a, in my front yard. Um, that's what I don't use a killer in my front yard. So I dig out I dig out my dandelions. 
and it works like a charm also. And the other thing is, is if you're in your garden and you drive it into the ground, if you get down and you can't get up, this handle is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but they also have shovels. And this, and this round is very easy. You can put a lot of pressure on that without having to really do a lot of body work. So it, um, it's, these are really super tools, and I think you'll like them. And they come in all different colors. So, How much are those two? Um, this one, I don't see a price on it. It's not the I'll double check for you. Okay. I don't know. The prices are not on this. This is around, it's probably $12 to $15, I think this one is. Somewhere in that area. On this one, I'm not sure, but he'll find out. So we'll check. As far as your fertilizer is concerned, this is my fertilizer of choice. I would not use anything else but this. It's called Grass Magic, and um, it not only is an organic, it's an organic-based fertilizer, but it also has uh, the beneficial organisms. It's got kelp in it. It's got mycorrhiza in it. It's got everything that your soil needs, and it works like gangbusters. And actually, uh, this will do 4,000 square feet, and it's not cheap. But what I do, because I don't want my, my grass to grow so fast, because I don't want to cut it all the time. So I use it at half the recommended rate. So if, you're, if you have healthy grass to start with, use, you can use it at half the recommended rate, and it'll do well. <coughs> you don't have to use it full strength. Don't tell them I said that. But it doesn't work. So, but if you've got if your grass is thin, then you use it at full strength the first time, and I guarantee you. Yes. Let me just say one thing about pet friendly. Um, I got an email from a gal um, who got very angry about uh, a lecture that she went to. It wasn't me, and they said it's pet friendly. The stuff wasn't pet friendly because her pet ate it. So don't leave this stuff around because an animal will eat this stuff. And because it's organic, and that's true of any organic. They, they will go, some dogs, some dogs will eat anything. I don't know, we, when I was young, we, dogs didn't eat anything. I mean, they didn't eat everything. But now they eat chairs, tables, whatever. I mean, people, I'm amazed at what they eat. So, so if you use this stuff, be sure and put it away, put it someplace where your animals can't get to it because um, she almost lost her dog with it. And if a dog does eat it, I would take it to the vet and, um, and have it checked out. Because usually what will happen is they, if they don't feel good, they won't drink. And if they don't drink, then they become um, dehydrated. So they do subcutaneous, and, and um, I've had to do that with my cat. Not, not because he ate that, but but he was ill with something else. So, so don't let you know. Don't let your plant, your cats do that. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I have. Oh, I was going to make a couple comments here about planting and some tips on planting. When you plant, it is really important that you never plant in dry soil. So what happens is, is that if you're going to be planting in the ground, go up, if it hasn't rained, and it seems like this year it's not going to be an issue, but you never know. Um, if, but if the soil is dry, water the night before, or better, the day before, or two days before, so that your soil is moist. It doesn't have to be, we don't want it sopping wet, we don't want to make a mess. In fact, that's worse, because if it's too wet, it will become compacted. But you do want it to be moist. If you put a plant, What happens is, is that those what nice white roots, they have what we call root hairs on them. And they're microscopic. You can't see them, but they are there. And that's how the plant takes that moisture. So if you put it in dry soil, what's going to happen is it burns those roots right off. And it just zings them. And, and that will set your, that, that's what causes plant stress. So it will usually kill the plant, but it won't do it any good either. So I always 
sure that the soil in my garden is moist before I plant. If you're using potting soil, I would want you, this is potting soil. It's basically Canadian sphagnum peat moss, that perlite, and it's dry as a bone. It's very hard to wet this, uh, especially if you're doing it in a large container. Because oftentimes what will happen is when you put your water in, it will run down the side and it doesn't actually get, you know, wet the potting soil. So what we want to do is we want to wet it ahead of time. And what I do is I will put it in a container, in this case, for an indoor plant, I would do it like this. I would just put it in, in a bag and so I have approximately four cups of potting soil in here. I will put one cup of water, or three parts. Three parts to one part. So it would be three parts water, or three parts potting soil for one part water. And let it sit overnight. And what will happen is the moisture will actually uh, absorb throughout and make it evenly, moderately moist. So that it's moist enough that it's not going to harm the plant, but it's not messy either. It's very easy to work with. Okay? Any questions about that? Three parts potting soil to one part water. And it doesn't make any difference what container you use. You could, we could use this tuna fish can and put three cans of potting soil in one can of water, put it in a bag or a container and leave it overnight. Kind of mix it around and it'll be perfect for you. And your plants will thank you for that. They truly will. The other thing I don't want to do is I never want to plant with um, dry plants. And again, when if the plants are dry, and sometimes <laughs> if the plants are dry, again, when you water them, oftentimes what will happen is, is that the water will just run out and down the side and out, and, and, the, and the root balls did not get wet, right? So what I do is, I will take some sort of a container this is obviously an aluminum pan. I would set it in here and then I would fill it with water and let it sit for maybe 20 or 30 minutes. And then the water will absorb up, it'll be nice and wet, and when you put it in the ground, it'll be perfect. It'll be a happy campus. And it will make a huge difference in, in your plant's ability to establish itself. Because again, a dry plant could be a dead plant. The other thing, when once you're done, and you water it in, the next day or two, I go around and I lift the skirts of my plant and I look to see and make sure that the soil did not settle because oftentimes what will happen is if this were in the ground, the soil settles down here and the edge of the plant is exposed and that, in warm weather, that will dry up very, very quickly and it will make a huge difference in your plant's ab ability to be able to establish itself. Okay? Any questions about that? All right. Does anybody else have any questions? I think I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's blowing away. <laughs> so, oh, one, one other thing. Um, when you do your, when you do your uh, shrubs, this is called mite. This is mycorrhiza, and it's a beneficial uh, b uh, bacteria. It's not bacteria, it's a fungus that actually is works with the plant around the roots to help the plant get moisture and nutrients. And if you buy this, when you buy your shrub and you plant it, they're giving, I believe, a five-year guarantee on those shrubs. Of course, you got to water them, too. you got to be honest about that. Don't bring back dead shrubs you haven't watered. That's a cruel thing to do for a garden center. But anyway, this is really great stuff, and I use this on all the shrubs that I plant because, again, I don't want to have to plant them twice, and it's not that expensive. Maybe so, yes. Are we going to be okay with impatience this year? Her question is, are we going to be okay with impatience? I am not planting impatience. Um, I know people that planted them last year, and they got down, they got the impatience downy mildew again. So it's still out there. So my recommendation would be not to plant them. Uh, some of the some of the plants that we've seen that look really really nice are, um, uh, you know, using coleus 
and uh, a lot of people are using the new begonias. I love the begonia big. The begonia big gets flowers on it. It gets to be about this big around. It's a it's a four inch plant, so it's not inexpensive, but it it gets huge and it imparts a lot of color. And that's what I use with my uh, my hostas. And I and but I again don't do that bedding plant look that's not that's not my type of garden because i have an english country garden so uh, but coleus are good uh, you know the um, sweet alyssum is coming back big and that's a great edging plant it smells good uh, deer don't eat it i don't think rabbits eat it either i don't think anything eats it but it's a it's a that's a great edging plant uh, but then if you email me i will send you has anybody ever been on Deborah Silver's, um, her blog, her website blog? She does some incredible plantings. And one of the things she used was she did a chocolate coleus with uh, Silver Dusty Miller. It was outstanding. And she had all these gourd, and, and she, she does a really uh, bang up job as far as fertilizing. And her secret is, is that she mixes a slow release fertilizer when she pots up her plants and then she probably waters them every week or two with like a Jack's Classic or that, um, and so they get huge. And they were absolutely stunning. So you had this silver and chocolate look. And the beautiful part about it was there's no flowers the dead had. I mean, as long as you keep it watered, it was stunning. That's another thing that you want to remember is do not fertilize when your soil is dry. Water your plants first and then fertilize because if you fertilize, when that soil is dry, you take a chance of burning the, the roots of the plant. So, um, if you want to come up and look at this stuff, I'll be glad to. Another question. Oh, another question. I wish I had known all of this 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Was it in this article? Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, what, what, what does it say on there? I can't remember what it was. <laughs> right under the picture. Oh, isn't it? You can it, look at it if isn't, you want. Isn't I'm that, using the same one to go see if they sell these plants here. Oh, this is a heuchera. This is the heuchera, and this one I think is um, from Proven Winners. It's cinnamon curls. Yeah, the name is interesting. Yeah. The shape of it. Well, the cinnamon curls is... There are all kinds of heucheras that are out now. I'm gonna, I'm probably in the next three or four weeks, I'll be mentioning three or four that I think are particularly stunning. This one has a roughly edge on it, and it's that cinnamon color on the top, but then it's also a different color on the bottom. It's kind of a reddish bronze on the bottom. So, shade or sun? Oh, that's, I would say, I would say part shade, no more than maybe five hours of sun a day. And not in the hot sun. More, prune them. Yeah. You don't have to prune them at all, but in the winter time, what you want to do now is cut away the, the, tatty, the tatty leaves on it. Yeah. And one of the things you need to do with heucheras is, is that heucheras as they grow will form a neck. Their necks get longer like giraffes, so then all of a sudden they look like they're rising out of the soil. And what you do is you dig them up and plant them deeper. Replant them and plant them deeper. So that you bury that neck. You can also divide them if you want, but um, mine took a real hit this year, so they're not looking real good. Yes? How, how far do you cut that knockout roses? As far as you want. Um, you, her question was, how far do you cut back knock, knockout roses? You could, that's a shrub rose. And so what you want to do now is cut back all the dead wood, but then if you want to trim it down, you can trim it down. You can trim it down hard. I mean, so it's only, say, three or four inches tall, all of it. And then it will regenerate and come back. So, you, you know, it's that's up to you. A lot of people just take the dead wood off and kind of shape it a little bit. And that's my thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my gardeners didn't think that they had survived, but I can't believe that they... Well, her, her question is, is did her, her roses survive? That, those two, I think you have to wait because they can regenerate right from the bottom. So they'll put up new shoots right from the bottom, even at the top, died down and almost died out. Because we didn't see any green of those. Well, it's, 
it's still early. Okay, it's still early. Then they're going to stay there. Mine are just starting to bud out now. So. Okay, um, you want to come up and look at some stuff or whatever? You can go shopping now.